Um, if you're a guest here this morning, we're just uh, really glad to have you guys. I want to say Merry Christmas. Hope you have uh, an amazing time with your family. And like Isaiah said, I just want to reiterate, if you're alone, um, don't be alone. <laughs> let, us, let us come around you. Let us be family to you. And um, uh, the enemy wins when we're alone. So we want to give no enemy opportunity to win. Um, I would try to be done as close to 10. I know a lot of you guys want to watch the World Cup which I'm really excited for, um, and it's probably why most of you guys are here in the first service, and so it's okay. I'm, I understand that. I know what I'm competing against. Um, and, uh, and we're really excited for our first uh, service in January as well. Um, it'll be a time of commissioning out the Apex team. Um, that will be the last service that they'll be at. And we've actually asked uh, Fricky and Liesl to come as well. He's going to commission out uh, the team, and so they'll be here on the first there, uh, the couple who planted this church about 13 years ago. And so we invited them to come on out and to kind of give a commission out. So we're really excited about that. So if you know Fricky and Liesl, come on out. They'll be here on the, on the first. And we're really pumped for all that, that God has for us. So we're going to uh, finish our series, Behold series. Um, and it's been just a great time. Isaiah and Matt have done just a great job unfolding what it means to behold Jesus and, um, and what it looks like to, to, to behold him in, in, in the everydays, right? So every day we're called to behold him. And as we behold him, we get to show the love of Jesus. And so this morning I had the privilege to talk about Jesus and share this amazing story of him coming to earth. And the big picture this morning... I, I, I would I hope to get across is for, for us to understand and see that Jesus was needed to, to come and save us. There, there was a, a great need for him to come and rescue us from all of our sins. Um, w- the reality was is that we couldn't, nor can we save ourselves. We're sinful from birth. Um, we, we mess up. We do the wrong things. It took perfection. It took a, a great love to come and to rescue us from darkness. And so Jesus had to come, but how he came um, uh, w- shows his great love for us. We could have imagined that Jesus could have come as a king. Jesus could, Jesus could have come as, as, as a warrior and, and took over. And he could have come as a politician. He could have come as many different things, yet Jesus comes as a baby. And it's important for, him, for us to know and for us to understand how, how, how amazing that is that a king from perfection came to a broken world and started off just like every one of us, pooping and peeing and screaming in, in, in a manger, right? And so there's, there's some great things for that. And so if you want to turn to John 1, 1 through 18, uh, we're going to read a portion of scripture this morning. It's the gospel of John chapter 1. It's the fourth gospel if you have your Bibles this morning, if you don't have any Bibles, we have some available. You can open up your app. I know the game hasn't started yet, so I know you're not watching the game. But John 1, Vince, uh, 1 through 18. I'm just kidding. John 1, 1 through 18. Here it is. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and have, we have seen the glory, the glory of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out that he who I've said, he who comes after me ranks me be- because he was before me. For from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is the Father's side. He has made him known. This is God's word. And there's a a few kind of immediate takeaways that I want to pull out before we get into the main points. And the first takeaway is that Jesus coming as a child and maturing to an adult gives him an earthly perspective and an empathy towards us. 
It's important that Jesus came as a child, as a baby was born, because he has this empathy that towards humanity. We see in Hebrews 2, 17 through 18, it says um, that he was made in the likeness of every respect so that he became a merciful and faithful high priest to the service of God because he himself suffered, was tempted, and was able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus came and was tempted in every way. Jesus went through every obstacle that we have gone through, and he has came perfect out of it, and now he's able to help us, not to be perfect, but to pursue righteousness and holiness, to become like him as we're clothed in his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake... He made him, Jesus, to be, uh, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. It's because of Jesus coming to earth that we get to live in the righteousness of God. We cannot do it outside of Jesus Christ. Many have tried. We have tried. We tried January 1st. We're going to stop being addicted to porn or stop drinking or stop spending money that we don't need to. We have all these, 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 these goals, and we've realized that January 7th that we've we messed up already. We, 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 we've stopped going to the gym. We stopped cursing. We stopped doing the things that we made this goal about, and we realize that Jesus doesn't want to just change our actions, but he wants to change our heart, and from our heart, our actions change. See, the world wants to change the things that we can actually change, change our habits, change our ideas, but Jesus wants to make us whole and clean. And from that place, when we are surrendered to Jesus, when we, when we, when we follow him and we, we say that he's Lord and Savior, suddenly the inside out we start to change. Isn't that amazing this morning? Isn't that good news for us this morning? That we don't have to strive, that we don't have to work at it. He has prepared good works, but it's the good works that lead us to him, not lead us to ourselves as we are king, but Jesus is king. The second takeaway that we, we see this morning. It's not that he is able to understand us and get us because he came as a child, but we see that Jesus has an eternal perspective. Yes, Jesus came as a child. Yes, he was a woodworker. Yes, he, he understood business. He understood people. He, he got to understand the world. But in Luke 19, for the, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. We don't want to be confused this morning that Jesus just came to be a good man. I'm sure he made good tables. I'm sure he made good chairs. That's separate from the reason, the eternal reason why he came. He came to redeem man, to redeem you and me, to be saved and rescued from darkness into the glory of God, one day being with him forever in eternity. We got to remember that Jesus had a bigger picture than we often have. And what we as followers, sometimes we, we get stuck in the weeds and we have to get back into the eternal perspective of why did Jesus come? This is a good time to speak to your children, to remind yourself Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Presents are good. Christmas carols, dinners, those are all great things. We should do those things. God's blessed us to do those things. But that is not the main reason why we're celebrating uh, Christmas. It's because Jesus had a better uh, future than we had for ourselves. Luke 4, 18 through 19. We get this... this, this, um, this, uh, this, this reason of why, of why Jesus came. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because it's Jesus talking, to pro- uh, and anointed to proclaim the good news to the poor. We get this little, like, this little job description of what Jesus came, to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to those who are captive. Maybe you're captive this morning. Maybe you need to hear good news. To recover the sight of the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed. Who's oppressed this morning? Jesus came to re- free you from the oppression of the enemy, to free you from the oppression of the world, to free you from the oppression of ourselves. We sometimes are our greatest enemy, and Christ has come with a bigger picture to free you, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus had a clear purpose, an eternal purpose purpose. The last takeaway we see before we get into our points is that Jesus has personal investment into us. We see this in Genesis 1, 26, 31, and God said, let us make man and woman in our image, in our likeness. We see that the, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit created us out of the likeness of the Godhead. And it says in verse 28 that God blessed them Go be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It's important for you to know this morning, especially those who are oppressed, depressed, who, whose maybe his identity is locked into something, um, and sometimes we get a, a skewed view of ourselves, that God says that he blessed you, and he says you are good. 
You are good this morning. You are good enough because Jesus has allowed you to be good enough. If some of us look in the mirror, maybe this last week, and we're like, I wish I was just, uh, I wish I was a little bit taller. I wish I was a baller. I wish I had a phone that, no one? Okay. All right. All right. And we look in the mirror and we think, how did I get to this point? When I was 20, I had this goal and vision for myself, myself, my family, and I'm only here. How do I get to this point? Can I tell you this morning that Jesus, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have a, a personal investment into you? They, they, they invest into you by creating you like themselves. See, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, he's talking about marriages, but it's actually pointing to Jesus. He says, husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church, and he gave, up, gave himself up for her that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that that she might be holy and without blemish. See, the enemy would would say is that if if you want God's love, you got to work for it. Or the enemy might say is that you're not good enough. Or the enemy might say, did God really die for you? Or or are are, are you really a Christian? And all these lies that we hear um, so often, and we see here is that Christ's um, love for us, that he not just, didn't just create us in his image, that, that, that you know, when, when, you, when you walk around with your kid and your kid looks just like you, and like, oh, you just look like your dad, there's something, there's something nice about that. And it's the same thing as, as we represent Jesus. That's why they say that you look, you look you're minus of Christ, that Christ, little Christians. You're minus of something that how Jesus walked and how he talked and, and the authority that he had. And so as we live out our faith, we are all adopted into this family. And the beautiful thing about the God adoption is that we, we, we become less looking like what we were and more look like who he is. It's this evolving family that becomes one. And when we get to heaven, we'll be without spot or blemish, and we're going to be with Christ forever, his ultimate love. See, it's usually in these seasons when it's hard and we've lost family members or, or, or kids or whatever may be going on, we allow other things. It's good to mourn through those things. It's good to work, with, work out those, those emotions with people, but we got to make sure that we don't add to that pile this, 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 this idea that Christ actually doesn't love us or doesn't want to be with us because he was born as a baby. He knows every step of our lives. He knows what we're going through, and yet he has come through faithful. And the gospel is that we hang on to him. There's nothing else that the world can offer us. There's nothing else that in a way that we can live that gives us freedom or gives us true joy. It's when we hang on to Jesus, our king, our rescuer, the one who went before us, the perfect, perfected righteous king, our lover. When we, when we hold on to him, we get this perspective. We get this life that we were meant to live. So as we get into kind of our main points this morning, even now, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to start to speak life to you. Open up your ears to what Christ may want to speak to you this morning. Don't allow um, your, your the kind of a cynical part of our brains or this, this over-logical type of our brains to come in and, and to... And to, uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, stop you from eating from the bread of life this morning. You are worth it. You have value. You are good enough because Jesus said you are. He is a faithful father, and when you're followers of Christ, we are faithful children. It may not always feel like it all the time. It may not always seem like it, but we're, we're faithful because he is faithful. And as we continue to follow in his steps and to follow his example, we'll continue to see the joy that Jesus had going to the cross. With joy, he went to the cross, endured the cross. He suffered and with pain because of you. We, I love the, 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 the story of Jesus being born. I love that he wasn't born in a castle. I love all those things. But Jesus being born was the start of it. We, we got to remember that it's the cross and the resurrection that is also something to rejoice about that Jesus came knowing that that was ahead of him because he loved you. We see in John 1 1 here, he says, so that you can get the right to become children of God. Do you feel like you have the right to to be a child of God right now? Do you feel like you have the right to even be in this room? Can I tell you, you do? 
It's by the blood of Jesus. It's by the birth of Christ that you have the access to be here. Point number one, as we look at our scriptures, we see that, uh, verse four that Jesus is life to a dying world. We see in verse four, he says, in him, in Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. In Jeremiah 10, 10, we see in the Old Testament, he says that our Lord is the true and living God. And we see in the Old Testament that they understood God to be this true and, and, and living God, that there was life in Christ, that he was the, he was the ultimate life, and, and him giving life to us was a supreme gift to us. The present that, we, that we're alive, that we have breath in our, in our lungs, but also that there's going to be a resurrection life, that we're going to be resurrection with, resurrected with him again, and that we're going to have eternal life. Jesus is the common denominator of all those lives. He is the true and living God. We see in Romans 6, 4 that, 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 that there's this newness of life. And as we become followers of Jesus, as we seek him, there's this newness of life. A life that we can't even understand unless it's found in Christ. My life is going over, my life is going crazy. Uh, I'm barely paying my bills or whatever it may be. My, my marriage is falling apart. When we follow Christ, there's this new list of life. Every day we have mercies to live in. I don't know if you knew that this morning. This morning you have new mercies to live in. There's a newness of life that you can live in as we're followers of Jesus. John 11.35 talks about abolishing death. Why? Because he holds the power of life and death. Jesus is the source of life himself. Death couldn't even hold him. Think about that. Death couldn't hold the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Jesus is the source of life. And we see in scriptures that Jesus says he is the only way to life. He's the only way. There's no subscription you can buy online. There's no, there's no uh, other God that, that is, is the way to, to life. Jesus says, I'm the only way, the truth, and the life. He's, he's, he's the source of life. Nothing compares to Jesus. I want you to hear that this morning. Because you're going to go out Monday morning and wake up. And you're going to be, the, the entertainment of the world is going to try to vie for your affection that there is other life out there. If you just invest in gold, or if you just invest into your CD account, or if you just invest into this, you will, you will have long life. Can I tell you that's not true? Jesus is the only way to true life. And you may be asking yourself, well, what is true life? What does true life look like? Well, if you look at the fruits of the Spirit, that's, at least that's a good place to start. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Do, do you have any of those this morning? Because that's a good start to have life. I don't know about you, but if I have true love in my heart and true kindness and peace and patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, if I have those things, I think, I'm, I think my life is actually pretty good. I, I, can, I don't have to respond to somebody uh, when, when, when they come in front, when they, uh, you know, get in front of me in the car. I don't have to. I can be gentle to someone who hurts me. Wow, that's true life question this morning is that do you are you living in the newness of life that God is offering us the second thing we see here is not that Jesus is just life to a dying world but Jesus is light to a dark world we see in verse four and five we read again it says in him was life and the life was a light of men the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it second chronicles he's talking to his people and he says there's this promise of light to come there's this promise of light to lead them as they're walking through the wilderness. He's talking to, to, to the people, the, God's people, and he's talking that one day there's this light coming. And this light, it will not be overcome by darkness. No king, no, no, um, nothing can, can dim this light. It will be the light of men. How beautiful is that to see that in Scripture, that in the Old Testament there was this promise of this light. Can I tell you that in the dark world that we live in today, we definitely need the light of Christ. We definitely need the light of Christ. Job 29.3, he has this, this phrase. He says that, as I walk through the darkness, you are my light. I love that. I mean, if you know Job's story, he probably needed a big light, right? There's all these things that happened to him. And he says, as I walk through the darkness, you are my light. It's important for us to call on Jesus to be our light. There are many other things that I think we call on sometimes. Instagram, Facebook, 
Sometimes we just look at our bank accounts just to, just to give us hope, just to give us light. Sometimes we just look at, our, at, at all of our successes, and, and maybe that's what gives you light in, in the midst of your hardship. Maybe you, t- maybe you turn to things that you know it's not helpful for you to give you light in the midst of hardship. Can I tell you that Jesus wants to be the light that helps you to walk through the darkness? Here's the thing about Christianity. Jesus never said we wouldn't walk through darkness. He just said, I'd be your light when you walk through darkness. In the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. In the valley of shadow of death, Christ is our light. Revelations 22, 4 through 5, the end of time, we get a glimpse of what heaven will be like. And it says that Jesus' face is so bright that there's no need for a sun. We have this Old Testament prophecy of the light that's going to come, that's going to be with his people. We see, we see it where a, a, a cloud by day and a fire by night leading their people through the wilderness. We see that Jesus comes and shows. Or we even go, sorry, go back to Genesis. And Jesus says, let there be light. He speaks light. We see him go through the Old Testament. Jesus comes onto the scene and he says, I am the light of men. John's a very witness about him. This guy who's coming, is, 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 he's who we've been talking about, who we've been waiting for in the Old Testament. And then we see in Revelation at the end of time, it says that Jesus will be our light. And I think we've got to let that settle a little bit. We can get caught up in the sentiments of Christmas and, and all the fun things that there are to do, but just to rest in the fact that Jesus at the end of time is going to be our light. I'm not sure if you believe in global warming or not. We hear it all the time on the news. The sun's getting hotter. We're, 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 we're mistreating our planet. But can I tell you, when we get to heaven, no one can mistreat God's place. He will constantly, for eternity, be the light of man. All of heaven will be lit up because of how radiant he is. Can I, t- can I say, church, guests, friends, that we've missed something if we don't get excited to know that Jesus is our light, was our light, will be our light. I was talking to Randy and my mom yesterday, and Randy had this, this, this kind of phrase, and he said that the moment that we stop being, um, uh, what's the word, um, when the Holy Spirit doesn't convict us anymore, that's a scary place to be in. Where we just kind of live through life and we're not convicted by the things that we do that are wrong. And I was just, I, I, I was thinking about that this morning. And I think that we, we, we get to that place when we don't see that Jesus actually is light. John 3, 17, 18, it says, that many fear to come to the light for the fear of being exposed. And the enemy brings the fear for being exposed. Exposure is a good thing. Tim Keller says um, that, or Tim Keller's wife, Kathy Keller says, uh, the best thing that can happen to us is that we do get exposed as believers. Why? Because when we're exposed to the true light, there's healing then that can come. When we expose the, the things that we're trapped to and overwhelmed with, we, we look to Jesus who, who knows what, what we've been through in life, who knows the temptations that we've, we've gone through. And when we look to Christ, the light, it exposes the enemy. So we often, we often feel like he's going to expose me and, and, and kind of beat me up and, 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 and put me in front of the church and they're going to make fun of me. When, when Christ exposes us, it hurts and there's things that, there's consequences to our sins. We can't get away from that. But there's this, there's this healthy light that comes in. And, re- and exposes the lies. It's almost like um, there's, there's a story of, of, of this, this, this lady who um, heard that she was going to die in, in a couple of days. And she goes out and starts just living this reckless life, sleeping around, doing drugs, um, b- drunk. And that's not her personality. But she's like, I, I have like literally three, four, five days to live. And she goes and just lives this life um, and she gets a phone call, like, the day before she's going to die. She's like, hey, we got a wrong diagnosis. Actually, you're fine. And she's just now is thinking back of all these things that she just did. And I often think that's, that's the way um, things work, where we're like, well, I've already messed up once, so I might as well go another step. And I've already messed up twice, so I might as well, you know, keep going, rather than 
allowing the light of God to expose the lies that will continue to walk and break down our relationships, our marriages, or our friendships, and allow Him to expose that and, and to almost like, like put a line in the sand for us to not go any further. Because the enemy would say, you really haven't gone, really gone far enough, just keep going. What do you got to lose? Right? I don't know. I'll be vulnerable. I don't know when you're like a kid and you like do something wrong and you're like, I've already messed up once, so I might as well keep doing things for ask for forgiveness, right? That's a, that's a kid who grew up in the church, right? And that's a, that's a wrong theology. That's a, that's a child mindset. When we see that Jesus is light, when we see that Jesus is life, we run to him to stop the pain, to, to stop the addiction, to stop the, 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 the turmoil that's bringing upon ourselves and our family. That's what he means that the light will, will expose us. That's who Jesus is. Jesus wants to, to expose so that you can walk in freedom. Amen? The last point I want to pull out is that Jesus is grace and truth to a depraved world. We see that Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his re- resurrection is grace to us all. Jesus coming as, a, as an infant is grace to us. Jesus living his life, um, abolishing, uh, fulfilling the law is, 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 is grace to us. Him dying a, a brutal death is grace to us. Resurrecting from the dead is grace to us. Uh, preparing for place for us right now is grace to us. And in the Holy Spirit to be with us is grace to us. We're coming back for his bride and to judge the nations is going to be grace for us. All those things we see are grace for us and we see that they're truth. Again, we live in a time where truth is kind of irrelevant. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And we gotta, uh, we got to make sure that we discipline our minds and we discipline our ears and, and we actually do some study and research so that we know what truth actually is. Because a lot of times I'm finding Christians nowadays are, are dying to absolute truth because of sentiment. And can I say that's the worst thing that we can get caught up in? Well, my friend um, lives this lifestyle, and, and he, they're a great person. So uh, maybe, obviously, sin's not, it's not that bad. Therefore, this doctrine of, of purity or of marriage or of, of holiness is, is not, it's not really, God wasn't really talking about it. It's only for those horrible people who do bad things. And we suddenly start to change our theology because we allow sentiment to be the guide rather than truth be the guide. Jesus says that he is truth. There, there, he is the ultimate truth. And can I say, it's okay in this day and age to say that Jesus is the ultimate truth. We get so scared as believers. We try to like kind of go around the bush while Jesus is kind of, he is kind of a king, but you know, he's, not the, he's not like this dominant king, and, 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 and he is this righteous guy, but he's not this like overly kind of strong guy. And he's like, no, no, Jesus says he's holy. Perfect. Hate sin. Like he has a standard of what truth is. And so we submit our truth to his truth, and we live out his truth, rather than his truth being submitted to sentiment of our friends and our world and our family members. Can I tell you, church, this is what the Bible said in the end days would happen. They would exchange the truth about God for a lie. And we're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about like, Christians. I have really good friends who are changing their whole theology because of sentiment and because of how they want to live their life. I don't just want to have one wife. I want to have multiple wives. I'm going to change my theology. It doesn't work like that. There's consequences to our sins. And Jesus says that he's not just grace. And we love preaching Jesus being grace. But Jesus is also truth. He's holy. Habakkuk says his eyes are so pure that he cannot look at evil. It's the most scary and the most amazing verse I read when I was like 13 years old. And I still, every day, God is so holy and pure. And, it, and Jesus had to come in the flesh and die on the cross and cover us with his righteousness. So now when he looks at us, he says, oh, my son has wrapped, wrapped that young man or that young woman. He's clothed in righteousness. Jesus is both grace and truth. His kindness leads us to repentance. Jesus' kindness, the grace of God, leads us to repentance. Can I tell you, if Jesus kindness leads us to repentance, then we have to be careful that we're not trying to make another wall for somebody to come to be repented. Well, if you just got to change, you got to start talking like us at church, you got to start, you got to stop smoking, you got to stop drinking. Just, why don't we stop being the judges and just the kindness of God leads into repentance. The first community group that we've ever led in North Carolina, there's about 20 of them, me and Rosalind, they were all smokers. Every single one of them. We take a quick break after eat, everyone will go smoke, me and Rosalind will be inside the house, Right? 
We could have easily said, you guys need to all change, get off Suboxone, get off smoking, stop drinking during the community group. You guys, during our worship practice, one of the guys would just bring a six-pack and he would drink, right? And we can easily say, you need to get kicked off the stage. But it's, it's, it's kindness that leads to repentance, right? We'll always stand for truth. We'll, we'll, t- we'll speak truth. But it's the kindness of, of our actions that lead people to repentance, Jesus gave a, a very, a very, a, a very um, clear way of how to come to repentance. We just got to make sure that we're not putting roadblocks in for that. It says that his grace is sufficient for our wrongs. I think some of you guys are going to hear that this morning, that, that Jesus' grace is sufficient for you this morning. Maybe you really messed up this week. Maybe, maybe you just dropped the ball last night, this morning. Maybe you and your wife are fighting now. I don't know the situation. But I can tell you that, that Jesus' grace is sufficient for you. We see that Jesus is a rock, a steady place, a safe place, which we can stand. I can tell you this morning that there's, there's, we, uh, there's a guy, um, I think on, on a reel that I was listening to, and he was saying, um, he's like an apologetic guy, and he, he was saying, uh, too, many, too many Christians keep saying that the church is under attack, that, that, that the Christianity is under attack. And he was like, he was like, you know, talking about. He's like, can I, can I just tell you that Christianity, God's not under attack. <laughs> he's still truth, and he's still grace, and he's still strong. He's not under attack. We may feel under attack, but as we hide ourselves, hide ourselves in God's hiding place, in the presence of God, as we walk with Him, we then aren't under attack either. Why? Because Christ is our truth. He's our steadfastness, where we lack nothing. Can I encourage you guys in this next year, be careful with what you watch. Be careful with what you listen to. Be careful what you allow to come in, what you read, because it's those very things that are kind of cutting off our own legs, and yet we have Christ who came in the flesh as a baby. Like, think about that. There's no other religion that that talks about a perfect God coming in the flesh, living a life, being, being crucified and raising from the dead. That is ultimate truth that we have. It's what gives us joy in the morning to wake up. I love this season because I remember that if Jesus didn't come the way he did, I would still be on on the road leading to hell. So some action steps this morning. Number one is receive life from Jesus. Receive life from Jesus, even right now. Maybe you're struggling right now. Just receive life from Jesus. What often happens when when, when I talk about receiving life from Jesus is it's because we're always fighting it. You know that, that idea where you bite the hand that feeds you? We do that to Christ all the time. We blame everything on him because it goes wrong, yet we need him when things are really, really hard. We do these Hail Mary passes and like, uh, prayers and say, Lord, help us. Yet Jesus is, 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 get, is offering life to us. So this morning, even if you're sitting here and you're overwhelmed, just, just right now, just receive. The Holy Spirit wants to minister to you and to give you life. And don't just receive, and don't just fight it, but stop, uh, start receiving daily the life of Christ. We cannot go a day without Christ. We you just can't. We weren't created that way. We were dependent upon something, and that something is Jesus. And there seems to be this grace for us to choose other things, and so we learn from our mistakes, but Jesus is there to give us life. Don't settle for anything that the world offers. Die to yourself. Run to Jesus, because he brings joy, he brings life. I know these things may seem kind of elementary, but we often just don't. Have you ever seen Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Like, we forget pretty quickly what we learned in fifth grade. Receive life from Jesus. Number two is to live in the light of Jesus. There's like God's responsibility and our responsibility. God's responsibility, he brought light into the world. He brought light into the world. That was God's response. We couldn't do that. We couldn't force or manipulate God to come. Here's our responsibility. Run from darkness. Run from darkness. What does that mean to run from darkness? Run from sin. Run to Jesus. And it's happened so, so, in, in such small ways. Someone comes to you with gossip and you just listen to it. That's running towards darkness. Running from darkness and saying, 
Ah, I can't hear this. I put the thing up on, on my Facebook. If you have time, you'll look at it. Socrates kind of get, telling what, what gossip is. He says, is it, is it kind? Are you being kind about the person? Can you actually help the person that you're telling? Like, can this person help you help this person that you're gossiping to? And third, is it, do you know 100% that it's truthful? And so many of us say things without knowing 100% that it's truthful, and we know that it's not, bringing, it's not kind. It's, it's actually death. And thirdly, we know that that person we're telling to can't even help. We just say it so we can get fulfilled with our selfish desires. Running away from sin is running away from gossip, away from slander, away from, uh, from things that are not of God. Does that make sense? Live in the light of Christ. Learn to enjoy the light. I think this is a big one as well that I was, I was kind of studying this week. I don't think a lot of us know how to enjoy to live in the light. What do I mean by that? It means that we learn to live in the, in, in, in the righteousness and the holiness of God. We, it's It's awkward. Even right now, maybe I'm saying some things that are like, ooh, ah, yeah, learn to live in that place. I don't know if you, uh, if you, if you guys play, ever played football. Um, I don't know if soccer does Hell Week, but with football and Hell Week in the summer, you kind of get back into it, and, and your body is just getting tore up. You're, you're, I mean, three, two a days, three a days in the heat, 100 degrees, you're running, you're running, and the coaches always say, just, just learn to enjoy the pain. That's going to help you. If you just think about how hard it hurts and how overwhelmed you are, if you, if you can get your body to just enjoy that, knowing that this pain is going to produce something good. Always look at the championship game, the last game of the year. This, we, we're always looking ahead. And so often I feel like we don't know how to learn, we don't, we don't know how to live in the light, in the light of God. It means that we're being accountable. Who's accountable with somebody this, this morning? You don't have to raise up your hand, just hypothetical, right? Who's accountable to somebody? Accountability means that one person at least knows everything about you, and that one person would be the one who, who would have to go and tell your wife or go and tell the pastor what's really going on, not someone who just listens and, and is like, agrees with you. Who's that one person? Because that's what it means to live and learn to live in the light, being accountable. Learning to live in the light means going to Jesus first before anything else. And I think if we can learn to live in this light, the light that God sheds on darkness and to bring, bring, to, bring, to bring us into light, I think that we'll live a more life sought after God. The last thing with living in the light is don't let the enemy win in your head and in your heart. Oftentimes, darkness starts at our heart and our head. It could be either one first. It could be our heart, then go to our head, head to our heart. It lives up here. And we can fake it on a Sunday morning, Right? Um, I don't know if you guys have heard Twitch's story just, just uh, passed away, and, and the, the phrase is like, no one ever knows what goes through t- the people's ears, their head. I mean, you look at Twitch's life, you're like, this guy seemed like a great family, the picture of his family, end up committing suicide. And you're like, how did a person get to that point? It's because they've allowed darkness to stay here. Just because we're living in the light right now and raise our hands and we like come out the kids and we're listening right now, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, it means a little bit maybe, but what goes on in here and here is more important. Jesus wants to bring light into our hearts and expose into our minds and expose the darkness. I've seen many great men and women fall because they never dealt with these two things, the darkness and allow the God to be the light. They're great ministers, and the Bible says many of you guys will preach in my name and prophesy and feed the poor, and he says it's just like a symbol, a knowing symbol. Why? Because they don't, is it the love to live in the light of God. Last thing is to be empowered by the grace and truth of Jesus. It's only in Christ that we can live out our true identity. It's only in Christ that we can live out our true purpose. When we allow grace and truth, it's such a good combination. I think a lot of Christians today live in judgment and truth. Or they live in grace and laziness. <laughs> right? We, we, we love the grace, but we never, we never let grace empower us. We let grace settle us. Or we live in truth, and we don't let truth lead us to Jesus, but it leads us to works. We're, we're the best Christians you've ever met. One guy used to say, I, a Pharisee would feel very welcome to my home, right? That was Nick Saltis, and you know that was probably true, right? <laughs> guy that we know. But we allow grace and truth. To, to empower us to live a life that he's called us to. Grace and truth.
grace and truth are the boundary lines to Christianity. Because sometimes I need a little bit of grace. And grace, what is grace to you? Godly grace leads us back to Jesus. And Jesus points us back to his goodness. Where sin increases, grace increases the more. That's a hard scripture for some people who live by works. Because they just want to whip ourselves. They want to, want, want to tell ourselves how horrible we are. And Jesus is like, I was already whipped for you. I already died on the cross for you. I came as a baby and lived the life that you were supposed to live that you couldn't. And died a life that you couldn't. And resurrected it, which none of us can do. And is preparing a place for us and will come back for us. Live in grace and truth. Let it empower your lives. Some of us this morning, 2003, needs to be an empowering year for you to live your life. I'm, I'm overwhelmed with my, I don't know who I am. Grace and truth. I don't know if I'm a good mother. Grace and truth. I don't know if I'm a good father. Grace and truth. I, I, I'm not married. I just, I'm single. What am I? Grace and truth. We're newlyweds. Grace and truth. My boss is driving me crazy. Grace and truth. I just want to be, I want to be used for him. Grace and truth. Jesus are, is grace and truth to us. As Dustin comes up, we're going to take a time of communion. If Jesus didn't come to earth, we wouldn't be taking communion. And Jesus, it's a reminder that Christ came from a place of perfection, came and lived a life, died and resurrected so we can have life once and for all. And I, lo- I love uh, uh, Kat and Isaiah were telling us a story of, of your grandmother who's 92, and she just keeps praying for God to take her home. I'm like, my mom's been praying that since she was like 30. <laughs> right? But it seems like there's, there's, there's people who just are like, love Jesus, like, please just take me home. And I kind of get scared when I hear people say that because I'm like, I don't want to go home yet. I want to stay here and enjoy, enjoy the earth a little bit, right? But I, I, I get it. Wow, in heaven with Christ forever, our shepherd. And so Jesus prays, teaches the disciples how to pray, says, as in heaven, let it be done on earth. And it seems like maybe that we, can, we probably can enjoy a bit of heaven on earth. And so as we take communion, let it just be remembered to what Christ has done. His, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, one day will come back for us. Just remember that. <coughs> And then take communion and be thankful. And say, Lord, thank you that, that one day I'm going to be with you, that you're preparing a place for me. So let's, we're going to take communion. You can go out through the sides, come back to the front, take it on your own. Dustin is just going to sing over us, and we're going to be done in a few minutes. And um, we can go f- watch Argentina win, right? And so let's just take that. Go ahead and take communion. And uh, Dustin's going to sing over us. <laughs>